There you go. Today we're beginning a brand new series that we're calling, there you go, Family Reunion. Family Reunion. So let me just ask you guys, get some help here. Those of you who are commenting on Facebook, get ready to peck away at the keyboard. How many of you, your family does some kind of reunion at least semi-often, once a year, once every couple of years. How many have family reunions? I see several of you. Several of you don't have family reunions. I see some more over here. If you're on Facebook, let us know. Do you have family reunions? Do you go to them? How often are they? Family reunion. Now, my family is a little bit small. I actually grew up on my father's side. I didn't know a whole lot about the family, to be honest. And when I was younger, we had family reunions. And have you ever been to Clark Hill? It's kind of a, a waterfront. It's a lot of water activities and sports. My family would go up there for camping on my father's side to Clark Hill, and we would have family reunions. And what was really interesting about that is there were so many people that were there, and somehow I was related to all of them. I couldn't fathom that idea. Like, you're what, uncle, again? You're related to who? Which aunt are you? First cousins, second cousins, third cousins, family reunions. They were coming out of the woodworks when we would get together. I remember there being so much food and then playing horseshoes. That was, that was my game. I played some horseshoes. It's where I learned how to play it. Now we do cornhole. We had cornhole at, at our family activities yesterday. And so going to these family reunions, and then you would see these people. It's so good to see you. And then what do they do? Of course, you know, come over. And I'm a skinny little boy. I don't have thick cheeks. And they still want to grab what I got and shake it around a little bit. It's so, last time I saw you, you was just knee-high to a grasshopper. We grew up in the South around here, in case you don't get the analogy. And so it was great to be together. And what was interesting is that you would, could come to these family reunions, and people who had not seen each other in years, they could pick right back up where they left off like they've never missed a beat. I love that idea about family reunions. It wasn't perfect. There were some strange people in my family tree, but these were these were my people. This was something that I could identify with. This was my tribe. This was a place that I belonged, a family reunion, a family reuniting, a family uniting. And see, here's the interesting thing and why we're talking about this being a family reunion, because the church is essentially the same thing. That when you and I come together like what we're doing today, Scripture is very clear that we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And guess what? That makes you my people. That makes us each other's people. That makes you and I family. This is our tribe. This is where we belong. And what's interesting about the body of Christ is that, well, blood is not the thing that connects us to together, and yet we're still family. What's interesting about the body of Christ is that we can have entirely different skin colors. In fact, after vacation last week, I was more brown than some of my brown friends. We can have different skin colors, and yet we can still be family. We can come from completely different cultural backgrounds, and you and I can still be family. And this is what gets me so excited about the body of Christ. This is what gets me excited about the union that we have, the unity that we have. You know, one thing that is interesting, though, is when we talk about, like, blood relatives. You remember the whole saying, like, blood is thicker than water? Do you remember that? Right? What's interesting to me is that in the body of Christ, we can actually have relationships with each other that have more depth than even our bloodline would carry. Isn't that interesting? That I may have an earthly time with you, but if you were not in relationship with Jesus Christ, then there is a termination of that time. But in my relationship with those that are brothers and sisters around the world, though I have never met them before, they still become my family. That we are a part of something so significant, and it is by God's design that we might be united. And so today, for just a few minutes, I want to take you to some places inside of Scripture. I want to take you to what I would say is probably one of the most powerful prayers in all of the Old Testament, one of the most powerful prayers in all of the New Testament. 
Now, if you're like me, you oftentimes pray things asking God to come and meet your needs. God, bless us financially. God, bring healing to this area, to this family member. We ourselves pray often. It's not too often that you find Jesus actually praying. We would see him in a few different places and instances throughout his ministry, but there aren't too many recorded prayers of Jesus. And so when he is praying, we should give ear. When he is praying, we should tune in. We should pay attention. And so I want to take you to this place in John chapter 17. That's in the New Testament. I want to take you to a place in John chapter 17, and Jesus himself is praying in this moment. Now, he knows that his days, his time on earth is coming to a close. It's short. And in this moment, he's now going to begin to pray over his disciples, and he's going to extend that prayer all the way through the ages to you and I who sit in this room today. So in John chapter 10, Jesus is praying, and he starts off praying things like, God, would you grant them authority in my name? In John chapter 16, Jesus is praying things like, God, would you give them power? God, would you fill them with joy? God, would you protect them? Those are great things for Jesus to be praying, especially over us as a church. But Jesus doesn't end it there. In fact, he's about to pray something that I think is so significant for us in the season that we're in today and the season that we're in as a church not just our church, but our community and our nation at large. And so Jesus is praying in John chapter 17, and I'm going to invite you to read along with me here, and we'll start in verse 20, okay? And so Jesus begins, and he says, my prayer, Jesus is talking to his heavenly Father here, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, not for just the disciples that I've been leading He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. What's he saying? I'm praying not just for the disciples that have been following me through this time, this season of ministry, but I'm praying for those who are far off, those who are in distant lands and those who are in distant timelines. He's praying for both you and I who would come to know Jesus as a result of the message of the disciples. You can go to the next. He says, I pray that all of them may be what? I pray that all of them may be. Okay, one more time. I need all of us in here. I need you online. Go ahead and say it with me out loud. He says, I pray that all of them may become. There you go. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may Believe you have sent me. Continuing on, he says in verse 22, he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be as we are, and I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete. Oh, Jesus was a poet. I think it's really significant because, you know, again, Jesus is praying over the disciples in this moment, and I think he could have prayed so many other things. God, would you just bless them and give them good health? He could have prayed other things. He could have said, Jesus, would you help them with their theology? They're kind of missing it over here. They really need to get this right in order for the church to function. He could have prayed so many different things, but he prays something specific so powerful. He says, Father, make them Father, make them. He prays something. Father, make them one. Have you noticed how much God is into this idea of one, of oneness? Think about it for just a second, okay? So you have the Trinity, right? So you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have three parts with different functions, and yet they are and yet they are one. Adam and Eve are created. God creates them, and then there's a union. He says that the two should become. So the Trinity, the one, creates the unit, the husband and the wife, and they become one, and they create a family unit, one family. If you continue reading through the history of the Old Testament and you see even how the nation of Israel was birthed. One family would become multiple families. And you may remember that there were actually 12 tribes. Do you remember that? The 12 tribes. 
and yet they were one nation. And so they had different functions and different roles, and I imagine even different dialogues, and they may have even looked a little bit differently, but yet here was a group of people, though there are 12, they are to be, they are to be one. Jesus, God, he cares a whole lot about this idea of oneness. And then you move into the New Testament. You move into the place where you and I would say, we're a part of the church of Jesus Christ. And he's praying this for the disciples. He's praying this for you and I. Father, I and you and they in me, there might be unity, that they might be one. And then you can see another place in Ephesians, in the New Testament, where God begins to lean into this idea of oneness. Let me show it to you. He says, there is how many? There is one body, and there is, and there is one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through and in, 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 and in all. That's a lot. And so God is into this oneness. He's into being united. He's into unity that's to exist amongst believers. And so Jesus comes on the scene and he prays this really powerful prayer. He says, Father, make them Father, make them one. Let them be united. Now, this weekend, yesterday was July 4th. That's the Independence Day inside of our nation. We're so grateful for the freedoms and the liberties that we have inside of our country. Yesterday, we celebrated an event that moved us into becoming the United States of America. United, a union brought together, United States of America. Yesterday, we celebrated that, and there's a lot to celebrate. But the truth is, in the moment that we're in, the climate that we're facing, the culture, the pulse, well, we've probably never been as divided as we are in this moment. United States of America, and yet culturally, we have things that are coming between us. More than COVID, isn't it? More than social distancing, isn't it? See, it seems like everything that can polarize us does polarize us. Everything on politics, well, to be a Christian, you must be Republican, or could you be Democratic? Everything that could divide us seems to be dividing us. We allow things to come in and separate us. We allow things, pretenses, things from our past, things that we've been taught, things that have shaped our minds, the way that we see one another, and they come in and they have room to Divide us, divided over political parties, news stations, skin colors. And I think this is an appropriate time for us to look at a prayer where Jesus says, Father, make them one. Because I think it's an important time for us as a church to determine whose we are, who we belong to, and what it looks like for us. And so I think we have to be cautious and I think this is a reason that Jesus would pray this. I don't think that Jesus ever goes into a place where he just lays something out in case it were to come up. And Jesus knew that we would face division even inside the church. There would be gossip. There would be slander. There would be prejudice. There would be separation. Jesus knew that. And therefore, he gives us his prayer to the Heavenly Father Father, make them one. He encourages us. He lends to us a prayer, Father, that we might become one. So what would it take for just a moment, if we could, what would it take to unify us, to be united, to stand together, not just on the Facebook page, City Church Fam, but to truly be family? What would it require? Let me give you a few of them if you're a note taker. One of them is one enemy. And see, in a time like this, when it seems like so many different moving parts are going on, 
What we need to do is realize that we have a common foe. There is an antagonist in our story. There is one who roams around like a roaring lion. There is an enemy at work, and we oftentimes point at people and situations, and we're not seeing influence behind it. And it requires of us Christians, Christ followers, it requires us to realize that there is a spiritual enemy at work. You remember from John 10.10, we quote this often here, and it says that the thief comes only to do what? And to, and to, and to destroy. And so that there is this thief, there is this enemy, and we can get united behind that it's not all of the other circumstances, that it is a spiritual adversary and we can stand united together. We talk about this often, how the enemy comes to divide and conquer. Here's what 1 Peter 5 says to us. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It goes on, resist him and he will flee. Standing firm in the faith because you know that the Family of believers, you and I, the family of believers, the fam, united together, the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. What does he say? Listen, I don't want you to be unaware that there is an enemy, there is an adversary. This is a common thing that we share. It is a thing that unites us together. The entire church, capital C Church, around the world the family of believers is all going through the same kind of thing. And so what ends up happening is the enemy begins to move in. And I've even seen places where he tries to get a foothold in our local congregation. Come in and bring slander, bring gossip, bring division. Instead of uniting together, trying to divide. And so Jesus prays, Father, make them one. So for us, we must recognize and resist and stand firm together. What would it take to unify us? One enemy and one heart. One enemy and one heart. What do I mean by heart? I mean the passion. I mean the place that we're going, the thing that we're aimed at. And I want to make this really clear, and you've heard this said before, that uniformity and unity are not the same thing. Right? So we're talking about unity as a church, specifically how God has shaped you, wired you, designed you, that he's given you roles and functions within the local body. If you are a part of this church family, God has given you function within this body. It does not mean that we all have to look the same, talk the same, smell the same. Do we understand that? Okay. And so anytime we're talking here about becoming united together, it actually means that we're going to embrace our differences. That might be skill sets, that might be skin colors, it might be any differences that we might have. We can be one under Christ, united together. I'm about to fall on your pedal board up here. All right. And so what would it take to unite us? One heart, all right? Look at what happened in Acts chapter four. Do you remember this? When the church is just getting birth, it's starting to explode in its growth, it's getting momentum. It says that all of the believers, there's the church fam, right? City church fam, all of them were in what? In one heart and in one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. Can you imagine what would happen within a local body, local community, local church? Can you imagine what would happen in the community around it if the body of believers would stop being inward focused? It's about me. It's about the name on the back of my own jersey. And we become Christ-centered we become bonded together and that I would put your needs above my own. You would put your brothers and your sisters' needs above our own. When we're united together, it stops looking at me, myself, and I, and it helps us to serve those around us. We are a family. We are a community. And we stand united together with one common enemy and with one heartbeat. John chapter 13, very famous place. Jesus is coming and he's giving a new commandment. All of those that you heard from the Old Testament, let me just bring them all together for you. He says, a new command that I give you to do what? 
to love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another, that we might be united together, gathered together by our love for one another. And so what would it take to unify us? A common enemy, a common purpose or mission or passion, I think, and then our purpose. One of the things that I want us to do, because, again, it's been a hundred and something days, four months since we were all together, I think it's important that we get back on the same page with one another. And so this is, this is what we're doing in this little family reunion series, okay? And so these are, are going to be brief little nuggets that reconnect our heart to one another and to what God's purposes are for this house and then for the city around us. So over the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear more about what it is for this family and what God is calling for us as purpose. And so there will be clarity on why we exist, why we do what we do, and why we're about what we are about. And just in case you may have forgotten it, the Great Commission out of Matthew 28 says to us, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what would it take for us to be united together? One enemy, one heart, and one purpose. I think that this is an on-time place for us as a church because culture and community around us is very divided. We have the opportunity by our love for one another to communicate an entirely different message to those around us. And so when Jesus prayed, Father, make them one, what was the reasons that he said, make them one? He gave us a, so that they will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Right? So go back here. Jesus prays that all of the disciples may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe. If the church looks no different than the world around us, if our church behaves the same way, talks the same way, acts the same way, then you know what they'll never see? They'll never see the love of Jesus Christ. They'll, they'll never see it that way. And so we, as a church family, stand united together. United, we stand with one common enemy, with one purpose, with one mission. We stand under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We are family because Jesus unites us together. One of the beautiful promises about the New Testament is that God would send his Holy Spirit. That God sends the Holy Spirit his Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity, part of the one, to dwell within us. The great thing about that is it's not a different Holy Spirit in you than it is in me. It's not a different Holy Spirit than in you than it is in me, or in you than it is in me. The same Holy Spirit, if we're a believer, comes to dwell within us, and it unites us together. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will go forward as a church through the power of the Holy Spirit. We will fulfill the mission and purpose that God has for us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be united together as family. And like they did in the book of Acts, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will love one another well. We will meet each other's needs well, and we will serve our city. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'd love to pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you, God that you are for us, that you are with us. God, that you are praying for needs that we didn't even know that we would have. But Father, in this season, we celebrate. We celebrate our church uniting back together. God, I ask for those that may have experienced some drift in their heart would be pulled back to the mission. God, that those of us who have kind of sat idly on our hands, no longer serving, that you provide more opportunity. God, for those in our city who need to hear about the loving message of Jesus Christ, would you use our church to be a part of that conversation? Now, God, unite us together. May we become the fulfillment of the prayer. Father, make them one.